Hello. Welcome. Hello, Neil. I trust you can hear me. Okay, thank you, Miles. Let's get that fixed. Okay, I've got Miles going. Nancy's here. Can you hear me, Miles? Yes, I can, Skip. Okay, great. Terrific. Okay. It helps when I send people out a intro invite. Um, thanks for letting me know, Neil. Um, okay. So, and Nancy, you can hear me, I presume. Yes. Okay, terrific. Um, all right. So this evening, we're going to talk about that ever popular topic, evil, <laughs> and the amount of evil that is in each one of us. And hello, uh, Britt, how are you? And John, nice to see you tonight. Um, so one of the things that we've talked about quite a number of times in this group over time has been to examine the spirits, which is the idea behind uh, the first letter of John um, in the Bible, uh, verse 4-1, in which Jesus says to his followers, examine the spirits to determine if they be of God. And I have been working on preparing what these spirits are. And it turns out that there's a, a terrific summation of them. Um, and these came from uh, a Cherokee legend that I've used multiple times throughout my writing career. And the story goes like this. An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. Quote, a fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside of you and inside every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. And so uh, I think that's worth giving some thought to. I actually, let's see, I thought I actually had a version of this on my screen perhaps, but maybe I didn't. Uh, and if I did, ah, yes, I do have. And so we can put it in the, in the video here. Uh, so Thank we, you, Skip, for that. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm just, uh, just wanted to say that that's a beautiful poem and uh, I'm going to read it to my kids. Because when you think about how we now have the uh, choice to make when we're online, uh, what we spend our time watching and absorbing. Oh, absolutely. And, and everybody's got to make uh, these choices. And so since we're talking about evil, we have to talk about this. And, oh, wait a minute here. Did I not turn on the record again on my button? 
we're all here still, so I must just a moment. Okay, I'm going to stop share. Okay, I didn't record any of that. <laughs> that was dumb. Um, so let me put it back up, but bears repeating. I think we. Um, yeah, it's worth repeating for sure. And uh, all right, so we're starting to talk about evil tonight. And since uh, Greta Thunberg brought up evil in the UN Security or the UN General Assembly today, I thought we should get a clarity on what evil might be. And so there's an old Cherokee legend that goes like this. An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going inside you and inside every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. And so I guess we've covered that thoroughly. I'll just add, it's a great lesson for everyone to think about as to what their choices are. For well, all and doing. very much so. And uh, today, uh, Greta Thunberg, I presume everybody knows who she is. She's the um, Swedish 16-year-old who's been making a lot of noise about uh, climate change lately and very effectively. And she has uh, given a speech to the UN where she literally screamed at the delegates. <laughs> and she said, for more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you are doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency. But no matter how sad and angry I am, I don't want to believe that. Because if you fully understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil. And I refuse to believe that. Well, okay. <laughs> She's 16. <laughs> uh, and, um, but she certainly is pointed, you know, pointed in the right direction, we have to realize. And one of the key things that Dr. Jung raised in his lifetime was the existence of evil and evil as um, as a great power in the world. And so anyway, let me see if I can set up my screen just a little bit better. Uh, good evening, Art. Nice to see you this evening. Um, I just have to. OK, now, if there's anybody on the on the panel who is not being seen or needs me to allow them in, let me know, please. And so I'm going to talk about something that's um, going to be difficult. Okay, I've marked today's session as uh, adults only because uh, it's hard to listen to this passage. Um, but I'm going to be referring to the Red Book by C.G. Young, the Reader's Edition, um, edited by Sonia Shandasani. And this is probably the most difficult passage in the Red Book. 
and it is um, uh, it compares for me to the book of Job or Revelation. And I know that many Christians kind of steer away from the book of Job and Revelation because they're so extreme in their content. But nevertheless, Dr. Young has over time explained to us uh, what those are all about. And so this is, this is um, another item. Now this relates to Dr. Young's own act of imagination where he was examining his own soul and um, and so this is what he said. I'm going to split this into several parts and hopefully at the end we'll have time for uh, Jerome to go through some of the images from this section of the Red Book. Um, but before we do that, I want to give you the prose. I'm reading from the section which is on page 3, 320. Uh, uh, Carl, could you um, mute? Let's mute your mic because I think we're getting feedback from you. Okay, so um, so this is from page 320 of the reader's edition. It's found on page 290 of the big folio edition, the one that's here over my shoulder. And so it's called The Sacrificial Murder. But this was the vision that I did not want to see, the horror that I did not want to live. A sickening feeling of nausea sneaks up on me and abominable, perfidious serpents wind their way slowly and crackingly through parched undergrowth. They hang down lazily and disgustingly lethargic from the branches looped in dreadful knots. I am reluctant to enter this dreary and unsightly valley where the bushes stand in arid stony de defiles, defiles. So it's uh, defilade, we would call it in the Marines. <laughs> The valley looks so normal. Its air smells of crime, of foul, cowardly deeds. I am seized by disgust and horror. I walk hesitantly over the boulders, avoiding every dark place for fear of treading on a serpent. The sun shines weakly out of a gray and distant sky, and all the, live, all the leaves are shriveled. A marionette with a broken head lies before me amidst the stones. A few steps further, a small apron. And then behind the bush, the body of a small girl, covered with terrible wounds, smeared with blood. One foot is clad with a stocking and shoe. The other is naked and gorily crushed. The head, where is the head? The head is a mash of blood with hair and whitish pieces of bone, surrounded by stones smeared with brain and blood. My gaze is captivated by this awful sight. A shrouded figure, like that of a woman, is standing calmly next to the child. Her face is covered by an impenetrable veil. She asks me, now I will, uh, this is a little bit of a, a dramatic reading of a play that's going on in Dr. Jung's unconscious or his, in his deep psyche. And so one party is S and the other party is I, and I'm taking I to be Dr. Jung in this case. And so here's the little drama. What then do you say? I, what should I say? This is beyond words. S, do you understand this? I, I refuse to understand such things. I can't speak about them without becoming enraged. S, why become enraged? You might as well rage every day of your life for these and similar things occur every day. I, but most of the time we don't see them. S, so knowing that they happen is not enough to enrage you? I, if I merely have knowledge of something, 
it's easier and simpler. The horror is less real if all I have is knowledge. S. Step nearer, and you will see that the body of the child has been cut open. Take out the liver. I. I will not touch this corpse. If someone witnessed this, they would think that I'm the murderer. S. You are cowardly. Take out the liver. I. Why should I do this? This is absurd. S. I want you to remove the liver. You must do it. I. Who are you to give me such an order? S. I am the soul of this child. You must do this for my sake. I. I don't understand, but I'll believe you and do this horrible and absurd deed. I reach into the child's visceral cavity. It is still warm. The liver is still firmly attached. I take my knife and cut it free of the ligaments. Then I take it out and hold it with bloody hands toward the figure. S. I thank you. I. What should I do? S. You know what the liver means. You ought to perform the healing act with it. I. What is to be done? S. Take a piece of the liver in place of the whole and eat it. I. What are you demanding? This is absolute madness. This is desecration, ne necrophilia. You make me a guilty party to this most hideous of all crimes. S. You have devised the most horrible torment for this murderer, which could atone for his act. There is only one atonement. Abase yourself and eat. I. I cannot. I refuse. I cannot participate in this horrible guilt. S. You share in this guilt. I. I? Share in this guilt? S. You are a man, and a man has committed this deed. I, yes, I am a man. I curse whoever did this for being a man, and I curse myself for being a man. S, so take part in this act. Abase yourself and eat. I need atonement. I, so shall it be for your sake, as you are the soul of this child. I kneel down on the stone, cut off a piece of the liver, and put it in my mouth. My gorge rises, tears burst from my eyes, cold sweat covers my brow, a dull sweet taste of blood. I swallow with desperate efforts. It is impossible. Once again and once again, I almost faint. It is done. The horror has been accomplished. S, I thank you. She throws back her veil a beautiful maiden with ginger hair. S. So do you recognize me? I. How strangely familiar you are. Who are you? S. I am your soul. All right. So, um, any comments so far? <laughs> What, what is being presented to, here, to us here is the recognition, how we have to recognize that we have evil within us. And so Dr. Jung, through his act of imagination, is being presented with something he finds truly horrific. But most of us don't realize how um, horrific life is and we we don't think about our own evil for example when you go to the grocery store and buy anything anything you buy at the grocery store is something that was once alive that you're eating to stay alive and you know, the Buddhists have a saying, and I'm, my wife, the Buddhist, accuses me of making this up, but the, I believe that a Buddhist once told me that all life lives on other life. But we've sublimated it so much that you don't think about 
what has died in order for you to live. But uh, that is huge when you think about the number of chickens or chicken babies that you might have eaten in your lifetime, the number of steers you might have eaten or whatever it is. Um, obviously, if you think about those things, it's quite horrific. And there's a reason that Dr. Young put this in the book, which we're going to get to next. But anybody, can anybody comment yet or are you still in shock? Well, I'd like to say something about what happened to me this summer. Please. Uh, I was in a very bad state mentally and physically. And I read in Mysterium Conjunctionis about the fact that you know, to consider my opinion and my desires and, and so forth above what God would want for me was evil. That just hit me between the eyes because I had a whole list of things that I could say, you know, well, I know I should do this, but I'm doing this other instead. And uh, that really was a humbling experience for me. But out of that came something quite wonderful which is that my daughter and my son, both adults now, who had wanted to tell me how I had messed up their lives at various points, and they couldn't because it would always hit shame when they began to talk and I wouldn't listen to them. Now I knew I had evil, that I, was at, and I had evil and good. And so I was free to listen to them, to hear what they had to say. And there was a great healing there between both of my children and myself. That's, um, well, I'm delighted to hear that. And we'll, we'll hear more as we go on here about uh, why that healing can take place in that way. Uh, Craig, I'm sorry I hadn't uh, seen your, your um, hand raised before, oh. but uh, yeah, you're, you're right. on now. <laughs> yes, okay, yeah. Um, well, you, you know, this, this is a very profound statement, I think, uh, you know, and if you put it in the context of uh, the other um, visions in, in the Red Book, I mean, uh, his, uh, uh, his, that, that Salome was blind, the fact that he murdered Siegfried, uh, and, uh, you know, felt great guilt from that. And the, uh, 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 the red one, you know, that he met in the tower, who was the devil. Right. And then also um, the blue shade at the end, who is Christ. You know, you put these things all together and... Uh, you know, it, it does have some context. Uh, Absolutely. Why was, why was his, why was Salome, his anima, uh, Salome blind? You know, why couldn't, why she, did she have no vision? And then, you know, you add to this, the fact that he turned into Ion or Abraxas. Right. You know, and this is going to come out <clears throat> in the black books, but, uh, you know, also his, God was Thanes, you know, I mean, so this, this all fits together. And I think it also, another aspect of it is the uh, visions he had, this was all coming around World War One. you know, his, his uh, vision of Siegfried being murdered, murdering the hero was almost exactly contemporaneous with um, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand being assassinated in Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. And uh, then also the flood that surrounded Switzerland of dead bodies. And uh, Sonu Shamdasani says, and every morning he would read in the new Zeriker Zeitung about uh, all the deaths at um, during uh, the uh, World War One in the trench warfare. So, I mean, it all kind of fits together. I, I think especially with the to me, the, the vision of the red one and the vision of, of well, and Philemon and, and the blue shade was Christ. Right. And, and, 
you know, one thing I was thinking about today, and I'll just end it, but this, but this is what thing Young said in Symbols of Transformation is, you know, that a thousand years is about 30 generations, you know, right. and, uh, you, you know, uh, Europe, that's about when, when Europe was Christianized, at least in the northern parts of Europe, in sure. Germany and Norway and Sweden and, uh, and Ireland. And uh, uh, if you take uh, the time that um, Neanderthal man and, and Homo sapiens lived together, that was 750 generations ago. And there's been only 30 generations of, of uh, you know, Christianized Europeans. Right. And then, then you take behind that. And, and you know, any hunting tribe that you find and this was this was uh, where did the word skull come from? You know, mm -hmm. when when the, when people say skull, I mean, basically, that's a um, is a salute because you're drinking out of the skull of your enemy. You know, mm -hmm. and they would also, you know, um, I mean, this is something that Native Americans and everybody did when they would uh, they would eat the brains or the liver of their um, enemies so that they could, could acquire their magic their magical power or you know mm -hmm. if they had a very crafty enemy i mean they were trying to uh magically uh assume the powers of their of their uh of their enemies but anyway this and all of course kind of fits. It, yeah and of course that's the um sort of the origin of the term grok as robert heinlein had and uh yeah strange well i mean in anyway, it's, a, it's an ancient ancient um uh, you, you know, Young is a is a uh, is, is a Swiss uh, European, and, uh, and and to me, it is an extremely profound. The soul tells him that this shattered child with the head missing is her, and that the only way to atone is for him to eat the liver. And where do we see liver being eaten uh, other places? Um, it's when Prometheus, you know, um, is uh, punished by Zeus for stealing the fire of ego consciousness by being chained to the Caucasus, which right. is represents the unconscious. So he's chained to the unconscious because he can't escape it, even though he's got ego consciousness uh, from the fire, but he right. can't get rid of the unconscious. And so then the eagle who's the masculine spirit of, of discrimination comes and eats his liver every day, which is his um, life force, his body, his life force. So every day, the spirit of ego consciousness, which he tried to liberate comes and eats his liver. So, I mean, anyway, it's, to me, it's very profound and how you possibly interpret it. I mean, you have to fit it in with all these other visions Right. So, Craig, let me go on to the next page. Oh, OK. Us. I thought you're done. I'm sorry. No, no. There's two more sections here. And uh, then there's still another section, which Jerome is going to help us with. But um, all right. So this is just one more page now. The sacrifice has been accomplished. The divine child, the image of the God's formation is slain. And I have eaten from the sacrificial flesh. The child, that is, the image of God's formation, not only bore my human craving, but also enclosed all the primordial and elemental powers that the sons of the sun possess as an inalienable inheritance. The God needs all this from his genesis. But when he has been created and hastens away into unending space, we need the gold of the sun. We must regenerate ourselves. But as the creation of a God is a creative act of highest love, the restoration of our human life signifies an act of the below. That is a great and dark mystery. Man cannot accomplish this act solely by himself, but is assisted by evil, which does it instead of man. But man must recognize his complicity in the act of evil. He must bear witness to this recognition by eating from the bloody sacrificial flesh. Through this act, he testifies that he is a man 
that he recognizes good as well as evil, and that he destroys the image of the God's formation through withdrawing his life force, with which he also dissociates himself from the God. This occurs for the salvation of the soul, which is the true mother of the divine child. When it bore and gave birth to the God, my soul was of human nature throughout. It possessed the primordial powers since time immemorial, but only in a dormant condition. They flowed into, they flowed into forming the God without my help, but through the sacrificial murder. I redeemed the primordial powers and added them to my soul. Since they became part of a living pattern, they are no longer dormant, but awake and active and irradiate my soul with their divine working. Through this, it receives a divine attribute. Hence, the eating of the sacrificial flesh aided its healing. The ancients have also indicated this to us in that they taught us to drink the blood and eat the flesh of the Savior. The ancients believed that this brought healing to the soul. Okay, so obviously we're talking about the Eucharist here. Um, comments on that. What, well, the I, Eucharist is basically, you know, that uh, or the that you eat the the body of of the God, you know, through eating the bread. And, uh, you know, and then you drink the blood of God through the wine. And then the, in the Catholic, in the Catholic's ritual, this absolutely was the body of Christ. And it absolutely was the blood of Christ when it's been in this actual ritual. So, and, I mean, and, there of course, is, and of course, this is exactly where the atheists and the agnostics either call Christians cannibals, or um, they say, well, people have taken uh, the wine out of the chalice after the, the uh, Eucharist and Catholic churches, and they found nothing but wine. But of course, the point is that, as Dr. Young stated in paragraph 752 of Answer to Job, all religious statements of whatever kind are statements of the psyche, not statements of the physis. And so what he was saying there is that, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree when you're trying to, trying to test the wine to see if it's blood, uh, because it's not blood in the physical world, it's blood in the psychic world. I think something people don't realize is that ritual touches the person at a deep level at the unconscious level. So that in the unconscious, a person of faith taking the communion, uh, something is going on deep within there that makes that very real. Whether they believe specifically that it is the real body and blood of Christ the actual ritual of it is goes beyond the mind, beyond the int intellect, and yes. goes way deep down and is a healing act. Um, yeah. Right. right. The way the way I relate to what you've read actually goes back to how you opened, quoting Greta Thunberg. Trying to say it like she says it, Thunberg. Thunberg. She, yeah. she said that, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to look at you as evil, but indeed she should. Well, and obviously because she's implying she that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and the truth of it, it is, we are evil. And the sooner we admit that, and we are actually, until we wake up to it, living off of the divine children yet to be born and um, and and you know back in 1965 the president of the american petroleum institute that was when i was five years old he read to a gathering of people of the petroleum industry saying that if we 
do keep burning fossil fuels, the carbon dioxide is going to cause global warming and serious issues around the year 2000. Now, um, I don't know if whatever happened to Frank Eichard, but he said that again in 1965. Now we have been burning fossil fuels at ever increasing rates and we are continuing to do it. Now, the, I connect this to something I also recently learned is that First Nations, indigenous people, they thought many of them have lived with the concept of making decisions thinking about the seventh generation, seven generations forward. And that, when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's never been part of my education. I studied civil engineering. I learned how to, you know, use bulldozers to tear up the earth and haul right. you know, material. But nobody ever said, you know, but when you're doing these things, you should be thinking of seven generations. So in a sense, we are eating the liver of that child, you know, in a sense. Right. And, um, um, these are harsh realities that we have to wake up to. Okay, um, let, I want to go to a couple of the chats on uh, YouTube, but I'm not going to go to all of them because they digress too much. But uh, RJN444 said, I don't like the analogy of the wolves. They, uh, why starve the other wolf? That's not integration, is it? Wouldn't Jung advise to feed both? Yes, he would. And um, I was only trying to point out by the Cherokee legend that it's not only Jesus Christ who had the idea of, uh, of two types of spirits running. And of course, the Cherokee chief was talking uh, in a religious kind of way too. He wasn't talking about physically starving wolves. Uh, so I just make that comment. Um, and, uh, Let's see. The other one here um, is uh, Info Overdose has a question about or a comment about synchronicity. And I want to leave that uh, for another time uh, because, or, or not another time time, but today, but not until after we get to the end of this um, section because it will digress too much. So we will come back to it. Okay, um, let me go to the third section of this because it's uh, part of an overall concept here that I think needs to be understood. Okay, the, um, so reading on, and by the way, these next three paragraphs, the three big paragraphs, I had tweeted out in reverse order because in, in order for it to be in my timeline on Twitter in the correct order, I had to tweet out one sentence at a time from, from bottom to top. And what I found out was that they have as much wisdom in them in the reverse order as they do in the forward order. But anyway, um, here's what he says. There are not many truths. There are only a few. Their meaning is too deep to grasp other than in symbols. A God who is no stronger than man, what is he? You still should taste holy dread. How would you be worthy of enjoying the wine and the bread if you have not touched the black bottom of human nature? Hence you are lukewarm and pale shadows, proud of your shallow coastlines and broad country roads, but the floodgates will be opened. There are inexorable things from which only God can save you. The primordial force is the radiance of the sun, which the sons of the sun have carried in themselves for eons and passed on to their children. But if the soul dips into radiance, she becomes as remorseless as the God himself. Since the life of the divine child, which you have eaten, will feel like glowing coals in you. It will burn inside you like a terrible and extinguishable fire. But despite all the torment, you cannot let it be since it will not let you be. 
from this, you will understand that your God is alive and that your soul has begun wandering on remorseless paths. You feel that the fire of the sun has erupted in you. Something new has been added to you, a holy affliction. Sometimes you no longer recognize yourself. You want to overcome it, but it overcomes you. You want to set limits, but it compels you to keep going. You want to elude it, but it comes with you. You want to employ it, but you are its tool. You want to think about it, but your thoughts obey it. Finally, the fear of the inescapable seizes you, for it comes after you slowly and invincibly. There is no escape. So it is that you come to know what a real God is. Now you'll think up clever truisms, preventive measures, secret escape routes, excuses, potions capable of inducing forgetfulness, but it's all useless. The fire burns right through you. That which guides forces you onto the way, but the way is my own self, my own life founded upon myself. The God wants my life. He wants to go with me, sit at the table with me, work with me. Above all, he wants to be ever present, but I'm ashamed of my God. I don't want to be divine, but reasonable. The divine appears to me as irrational craziness. I hate it as an absurd disturbance of my meaningful human activity. It seems an unbelievable sickness, which has stolen into my regular course of life. Yes, I even find the divine superfluous. Now, what he's talking about here is recognizing the opposites within yourself and particularly the evil within yourself, which is one reason why I read the, the list from the Cherokee chiefs so that we could recognize that most of us have had all of these um, primordial emotions, both evil and good. And I just point out that all of the things that you can see in the images on this video are things that were decided as good. Therefore, each of us bought those things, whatever they were, books, computers, um, microphones for our computer, headsets, all these things are, we've determined that they are good. And of course, uh, our fathers and mothers thought we were good when, when they conceived us. So, um, but that doesn't mean that evil isn't there. And what, you know, one of the reasons a lot of um, soldiers and Marines come back from battle with PTSD is that they see up close and personal just how evil human beings can be. And I know I got my snoopful in uh, Vietnam. And uh, it's kind of why dear old dad never talked about the war, because there are a lot of pretty evil things that go on in battle. And I know when I was just starting off in the reserve after leaving active duty, um, there were no, no other uh, young captains or lieutenants around um, because most of the guys just got out. They just couldn't uh, face it again in any way. And uh, so they just left the Marine Corps and, and didn't continue. And, um, and so one of the points here is as we look at our politics and what's going on in our politics, we have to understand that whatever we love or hate is um, a reflection of us. So if you hate something, you have to understand that it's your evil in your own self that is, um, is causing that emotion and you're projecting it out on someone else as a way to get yourself out of it. And, and not take responsibility for it, but we all are, we all have responsibility for it. And uh, we all, that's why I mentioned the grocery store 
point that, you know, anybody that's a vegetarian just has never heard of a tomato scream, basically. And, um, and, you know, everything in the grocery store has in one way or another given up its life for us to have life. And, um, I don't think any of them wanted to do that, <laughs> whether they be animal or vegetable. So anyway, comments at this point, um, Jerome. Yeah, well, I was thinking more about, uh, you know, when you're reading about the uh, energy that when Young, uh, you know, made that final decision to eat the liver. And remember, this is a, uh, you know, this is uh, his uh, a way of, uh, uh, it's not real in terms of, we, we have to keep this in. The right yeah, it's context. not in the physical world. It's in his yeah, psyche. It's in the psyche and it's these images that come up to symbolize something. And we also have to remember that it, Jung always said it's his path. It's not uh, our path. Uh, what our path may be something in completely entirely different in terms of images. Absolutely. Uh, and oh, although they might, might be much worse too. <laughs> well, yeah, and they could be similar, but I mean, we right. need to keep the context in mind of what we're talking about. But uh, in some sense, what I got out of this was, you know, he's, uh, was very egocentric in terms of he had developed his thinking and his right. intuition ability. And uh, all of a sudden uh, it got ripped out from under him. Yeah, he had to give it up in order to do what he wanted to because, do. Because, uh, yeah, his feeling side uh, and his sensing side were undeveloped at that point. And right. so what this uh, does, it also brings him back from what you would call the logos side to the uh, he's introduced to the eros side right. what happens when he symbolically uh has that uh, uh liver uh you notice it said that his energy uh was all of a sudden directed down to the eros side and so he was using all his energy and his ego and developing his thinking and intuition right. and his success. And we've only got so much energy to deal with. Right. And so if you're lopsided, well, and you're yeah. using all that energy to on that side and you're neglecting the well, soul and, energy. Right. When we're when we're one sided, um, we don't have the benefit of our psychic energy. That's um, it. Yeah. Yeah. And well, you, you have some, but you don't have uh, well, not enough. And right. so this has been uh, the criticism of uh, Dr. Peterson because he goes into these things rather shallowly and um, one-sidedly in terms of staying on the, the rational logo side. But we well, have- he's, he's developing people for the hero's journey and then Young was following the hero's journey and then it it got ripped out from under him and then yeah. he fell down. But, but we all have to give up that particular journey. Because at right, some because point we, all, time, we all get run into a brick wall somewhere along the line. That's true. Yeah. And, and we have to have something uh, to give us energy to move on. And, and the energy actually comes from uh, the unconscious, from the dark side. And and, and you, oh, and you also notice that he says he really can't stand that energy coming at him, you know? right? And, and then he and then he backtracks and says this irrational craziness. Uh, he doesn't want to accept the soul and that energy coming up. He wants to be in control still, right? Uh, and and. and Right, and, and so remember in the in the Cherokee legend, they're they're talking about resentment and uh, false pride and superiority and inferiority. All all these self pity, um, yeah. those are there. Those are all dark side things, and lots of people go off and start little pity parties 
of themselves when things start to not go right. And so you need to recognize that this is uh, the dark side of your psyche that's pulling you down. Yeah, it's kind of like the angry wolf versus what you said, the good wolf. You know? Yeah. So and you, you've, you've got these sides pulling at you. So. Right. And, and so, and these spirits are all fairly evenly matched. The problem is that we, if we're very one-sided in our attitude, um, we don't appreciate how we come across to other people. I mean, I, I, the, the one that I keep thinking about every time I see it, and I see it every day, is this national rent-a-car advertisement where this guy is doing this very arrogant, um, you know, he-man, uh, very deep voice attitude of selling the, the national rent-a-car. And it, it's totally one-sided. And it just makes my skin crawl to hear him behave that way. I mean, do men really behave that way? I mean, good Lord. Um, you know, I know some do, but, you know, I, in the Marine Corps, uh, guys like that never make it past lieutenant colonel. And I actually have only known one lieutenant colonel that was like that. Um, and, um, you know, you can, you can be a he-man bodybuilder, you know, unstoppable guy for a period of time, but, but you have to learn how to be a human being too, if you're going to advance, even in, in something like the Marine Corps, which has this, this, uh, aura of being, you know, very he-man type of operation, but that's, I mean, Yes, it takes courage to go out and do what Marines do, but but um, it you don't do it the way, you know, you don't do it with a with a knife in your mouth and and uh, a gun that's bigger than you are, type thing. Typically, I mean, we, most of the time you don't, um, and um, so so, but. It, Anyway, one of the points that is being made here is that Jung is, through his active imagination, because this is being presented to him in his active imagination, he's recognizing that this very evil activity that he is experiencing in this little play that's going on in his imagination um, is part of him. And because of that, it causes the other side of his psyche to start to flow together and it gets his psychic energy going um, at the end of at the end of this um, uh, red book period after he's gone through this very dark um, you know it's called the uh, night sea journey sometimes uh, Jordan Peterson will refer to it as the night sea journey of going into this very dark place. But after he went into this dark place, then he came out of it and knew what his objective was. You know, just as, as uh, you know, Jesus Christ did it in very quickly in the, in the sense that he recognized in Gethsemane that you know, God wasn't going to let him off the hook to for the sacrifice. He knew that he was going to be sacrificed, and, and that that was that was what he was called to do. And um, and so we're all called to do something, but we have to recognize it. And that's what Dr. Jung was uh, talking about. Um, Skip. Yes, go ahead. Um, how does one keep from being burnt up by, by Eros and by this dark side if you're feeling an influx of it in your life? Say, say it again. I'm sorry. How I, Jung mentioned um, feeling like you'd be overwhelmed and, and you know, burned up uh, by Eros. And um, how, do, how did he uh, avoid that, it just consuming him? And, well, um, I mean, the, 
I think the traditional ways through are, are prayer or meditation or, you know, just going for long walk, walks and reflecting on what's happening to you. Um, I'd and, like yeah, to offer yeah. a suggestion. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Um, Carl Jung was talking to Robert A. Johnson at one time, and he said, if you will give it form, you'll be okay. And not too long ago, I felt absolute evil trying to rise up into consciousness. And I remembered that. And so I went and did a mandala and just let whatever came up put in the mandala. And it turned out to be a crystalline structure. And it ended up looking like a shield, like a superhero shield. Right. And it subdued that uh, sense of impending absolute evil taking me over. Right. And uh, Nancy and I have done a, a very profound interview or actually half of a profound interview. It's already three hours long, but <laughs> we're going to be doing some more of it. And um, that will be a very powerful interview for, for everyone to pay attention to when, when it comes out. I've been fighting with some technology over the last few days, but I intend to get that edited and, and posted as soon as possible. Now, one thing that one thing here is uh, Anthony Robert Roberts comments, prayers for Peterson. He has had a rough go of late and is in rehab at the moment. Okay. And on a positive note, his wife appears to be doing better. Well, we can thank God for that. She was uh, apparently uh, very in very tough shape in the, in the spring, but I don't know what the rehab would be with respect to Peterson. But, um, I would also like to add something about what Carl was uh, asking and Nancy's suggestion of, uh, uh, you know, painting a mandala or something that Young used his active imagination and all these uh, paintings in his red book are the ways he was protecting himself from being overwhelmed by the influx of the uh, energy that was coming from the animal. Right. And so it's going to burn and it's going to burn through and to keep from being overwhelmed from it, you do need to establish some form of practice uh, in order to keep that from overrunning. And that's how Young said that he avoided having a psychotic break uh, was by documenting, making his red book, doing his uh, writing. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the activities. And also to make sure that you, uh, the other side was to make sure that he was with his family and having a relationship and went to work. Yeah, staying and, connected to the to the physical world. And people, yeah, and just uh, in the family, people, and so forth. So that's uh, uh, the ways when you feel that coming. And, you know, that's, uh, that's the things that he did recommend. So I think these are excellent suggestions. Uh, right. Thanks, Nancy. Right. And, you know, when it was happening to me, I didn't have it happen for five years, but I had it happen for eight months. And, <clears throat> and what I did was write it down and, and um, you know, I thought I was writing a novel, but what I was doing was actually getting some stuff out of my unconscious that was both good and bad. I mean, there was an individuation process in there as well, but uh, there was certainly some, some uh, very dark shadow material there as well. Um, so, Anthony, I'm, I'm not going to read your last comment, Anthony. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate for the recording. Um, what, uh, one thing you need to distinguish is what you just said is what Jung was experiencing was not the shadow. He was actually, uh, you know, um, very permeable to to the collective unconscious and what he was experiencing were the images uh, of the collective unconscious. Now that is not the same type of darkness as of the, uh, uh, as compulsive behavior, which we call the shadow. 
You know, that's a different kind of darkness. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, the collective unconscious has a shadow too, as we know in the United States the, the last few years. Um, Mama Lama says, hi, everybody. I skip the rest of the panel. I, I had YouTube warn me that this might be disturbing content. Never had that before. That's because I said it as uh, adult material uh, tonight because, uh, well, if you have, didn't see the beginning, you'll have to go back and listen to what we were talking about at the beginning, what we were talking about eating livers and um, that was disturbing uh, or could be disturbing. So um, Jerome, uh, th this part of the red book has, um, has a number of images, it has uh, 12 or so symbolic images which indicate what Jung was feeling at the time that he was going through the, these particular passages. And so, Jerome, are, are you ready to go on that? Uh, yeah, let me share a screen. Here. Okay, why don't you share your screen? And, and so Jerome's going to talk us through that. This up here, see if that works. Can you see anything yet? No? Yes? Not yet. All right, let me try again. Look, if you can't bring it up, maybe I can. Uh, you're not allowing me to share, I think. I don't one. know why. I don't either. And, uh, let me just see. Huh. Well. Okay. Oh, maybe. wait, wait, wait just a minute. Let me try one more thing. There. there. So. So that, okay, there it is. There it is. We've got it now. Okay, can everybody see that? Uh, let me move my screen out a little bit. Right. Okay, this is, uh, there are actually uh, 19 images uh, that Young shared after this section. Uh, and there's been a lot of this, some discussion about why he, uh, and there's 19 images and it's actually for all the full page images it's 36 percent of the red book images are in a section so it's Boy. very very curious uh and uh, so the first image uh as you can see is um uh, you can see the uh i don't know if you can see, can you see my mouse or not hold on just a second okay um, could, could you unshare just for a minute? I just want to see how this is coming across on the YouTube okay, video. Let me see here. How do I get back to unshare? Stop share. Okay. Okay. How's that? Um, that was stop share. And then go back to... Go back me. to share. Well, no, no, not back to share, but back to... Um, back to uh, what? Regular? To no, not full screen there. Okay, now let me just see. Okay, I'm. Let me just ask the YouTube audience: uh, Were you able to uh, see the the share screen? Because I don't have it on the screen anymore. Um, well, see what happens is when you take over the the share, then I can't see the YouTube screen. Um, no, I'm sorry. Well, I mean, because okay. you're you're taking um, your it automatically takes full screen and it won't let me get by it on my uh, computer. OK. OK. So I don't know what this looks like to the YouTube audience. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not watching it on another screen either. So. OK. Anthony, Anthony says. It looked fine, full screen with Jerome in thumbnail. Okay, all, all right. right. So let's go ahead, Jerome. Um, all right, let's uh, go. Let's go back to what have I got now? Okay. Oh, okay. So now we is have that your... working now? Yes. Um, all right. I've got another screen up here. Okay. Now everybody's on the left. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so I don't know why he uh, put all these images on here but 
uh, he inserts these uh, images and there's some people that have written about this that said it's a nonverbal reconciliation of the uh, good and evil forces in him. And so the next image you'll notice is it looks like uh, uh, you've got four quadrants there and you've got the, um, uh, and these, these aren't labeled at all. Uh, they're just images that were presented and they have numbers, but that's about it. Uh, and then you'll notice this next one here is image 81. If you go back to image 80, what I see in this one is it looks like it's distorting. You see how it distorts out with right. the different layers and the different, there's four quadrants again and a star. Right. So the, I think what we're, what we're saying here is that Jung is, is expressing out symbolically what's coming up through his unconscious and yeah. how it changes yeah. over, over days or periods of time. Right. Go He's ahead. trying to reconcile the evil and good forces within him. Right. And it seems to be centered around this flower image. So this is kind of the uh, flower that blooms. And you can see it's, uh, you know, in full bloom and everything. And then all of a sudden it gets threatened. And so here's the threatening force that comes up. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the flowers uh, turn dark. And you can right. see this force coming up. And you'll notice that right right in here, there's it looks like coals, uh, like uh, coals glowing and fire and so forth. Right. So there's, there's there go. something pushing up out of the unconscious. Right. That's, right. Uh, that's the symbology of it. And then it, it keeps enroaching. And now notice how it distorts. It's right. coming up here. Look here. It's distorting. And notice the... And remember, he said there was fire in the dark side as well as the light side. So there's right. sun. he's looking at two suns that are coming up. Right. And there's a dark sun there. And right. all of a sudden, I think he's enshrouded on this one, I believe. So yeah. I think it is, he's, he's really uh, pushing. I'm, I'm kind of interpreting what I see. Uh, yeah, a bit the best way to look at this is to. Uh, you know, you can even just do something like Nancy does. It's called gazing, and you can just gaze at this and see what comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, you could look at these for, I mean, lots of time just to look at them. And then all of a sudden, there seems to be, I'm not sure anything about this one, but you'll notice the symbology here. And it looks like there's uh, streaks coming out, and the shape changes, so I cannot tell you anything about that one anybody have any comments uh, let me know well it, it's interesting the the colors you know i think if if young had done this um with a red book after he had studied alchemy and met richard wilhelm he he would have some uh, amplification that he didn't provide here and mm -hmm. one of them is is the negredo you know or uh you know the uh this the the fact that all um all movement comes out of the blackness. So uh, in other words, the only way that you can make a beginning is to have the mortificatio, the, uh, uh, the putrefying and the blackness. And then out of the blackness comes uh, the new event, you know? So uh, what you saw to the beginning at the end, at the start of your pictures, was a lot of red and blue and then suddenly it started to go back to uh start over again with uh with the with the blackness and one thing hillman says is is blackness is despair when you move from what he what his theory was was that you move from blackness to blueness and blueness is sadness and there is a difference between total hopelessness and despair and the sadness of suffering. At that point, you've moved into a more human uh, type of uh, 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 um, emotion 
where in the blackness of hopelessness and despair, there is, uh, there is nothing human there. It is only when you move to the color blue that you begin to uh, come back into the human realms. Yeah, I think this is the process uh, before he learned about the alchemical <laughs> process. Mm -hmm. uh, so it says, man, okay. And here it looks like it's in water. And notice this, uh, they call these things, and I can't pronounce the word, the steles, S-T-E-L-E, steles. They're kind of an ancient. Stale, uh, um, uh, it, it, like a prod it, or something. Well, it's it's uh, something that you write on, and we'll get to that in a minute. Well, uh, here they're also, Shandasani translates it in the footnote as runes. Well, True. okay, yeah, the ruins are next, but uh, we'll get first here. Notice okay. that he has a heat coming, a symbol for heat coming here. Notice okay. the flower is starting to, it looks like it's starting to rebloom again. Right. Uh, notice, uh, usually this means water, and this means uh, sky, and this means earth, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, this is where the ruins come in, and the ruins are written... And I'm going to uh, see these uh, writings on here. Yes. Okay, Young. Uh, okay, the room you're saying on the, on the, like a on the stair, gravestone. On, uh, right, right, on the, yeah, on the bottom. Yeah. Right. The stone. Okay, yeah. so they're messages. That, yeah, that he wrote, and he used the German, um, I don't know if he used the German, uh, type of ruins or it's a symbolic language he was trying to get as ancient as he could mm -hmm. in terms of trying to experience this as the original man so to speak. he was trying to get all the way back as far as he could go right and, and obviously in that scene there's a there's boiling over out of him something coming into consciousness now right, that's, yeah. that's valuable because it's gold yeah something that's merging and uh, right and then in this one he out a little bit and then these are the little ruins here that he's written okay it'd be interesting to know if somebody w could uh, interpret what those things mean okay uh, well I, I will read the footnotes here because they're quite extensive but go, go ahead and you complete your... yeah I, i've read some of those footnotes and i was confused <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they are a bit okay. confusing, but yeah. Uh, now here is here is the upper uh, coming down, and here's the lower. And you notice the two suns they call it, mm -hmm. and so the heat and everything. It's kind of like the alchemical process, as Greg right. was noting. And the star there might might represent the self. Okay, the uh, the little star in the middle. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And so yeah. anyway. These are fascinating images. I so it's say. showing okay. the opposites. Now the, yeah, it looks like this. it's starting to branch out mm -hmm. you know, into different directions. And, but yep. you've still got the two heating systems going. <laughs> it's like all right. dual heating systems. For well, that, that is what it is, sure. <laughs> yeah. And then here, this looks similar, the same thing. And you've got, uh, notice this uh, heat. This looks like... Uh, I guess this is water. He's kind of still in the middle here. Yep. And then this one, here's more of the ruins written across this one. Oh, yeah. And, and it looks like an eye, mm -hmm. and, uh, which uh, could be a symbolic thing. And you notice know, this little wavy line. Uh, and then we come to the next one. Okay, these things... These things here are starting to fade out. He's got more ruin statements here. Right. And this is starting to fill in. And that's the roots on the trees here. Right. So this he's, is where consciousness is coming in. Yeah. And, he's, he's showing that the roots are both down and up. Right. Uh, so he's, remember the upper and the becoming like the lower and the lower and becoming like the upper. Right. And then this image is things are starting to tango here. So everything's coming alive. Everything's <laughs> cooking. 
everything's cooking yeah so, yeah mm -hmm. right and then the last image it uh compresses into an egg that's floating it seems to be balanced mm -hmm. but as craig said notice the colors the alchemical colors the yeah red, the green the black yeah right and, and this is well he had gotten into alchemy before though before mm -hmm. he met wilhelm yeah. be because he had spent a decade figuring out a lexicon of alchemy because mm -hmm. he knew knew there was something about it that that he yeah. wanted to explore so it's like the four uh, counterbalancing forces are uh, uh, balanced and the new energy flows and finally the egg which is resting on the waters is it uh it's the struggle between the two sons between the upper and the underworld seems to be resolved and i got mm -hmm. this from somebody that had written a comment on it but mm -hmm. uh, i also remember one of the stories remember he takes the giant and uh, puts him into an egg compresses him into an egg right puts it in his pocket <laughs> yeah you know? so that's, that's my, putting putting the god in the egg <laughs> uh, yeah that was my association with so he'd keep right. him, uh, his ego down but i'm just absolutely uh have always been fascinated with this whole series of images and wondering why it was 36 percent of the images in the red book uh, yeah and done in that series well because he he was very committed to the idea of mandala by then and by the time he was painting these um and and so as a representation of what's going on in the psyche, because, of course, what's going on in the psyche, we can say is chaos, right? This is what Jordan Peterson wants a bulwark against. But the fact is, we, we don't have psychic energy if we don't have access to this prim primordial aspect of our lives. Yeah, we're cut off. We don't have that. And right. we, we overemphasize, use our, all our energy on something that uh, right. is away from us understanding and communicating with each other in terms of uh, just common decency and compassion and uh, right. being able to feel with the other instead of this uh, whatever's going on, you know. Right. Okay, I'm going to stop share if he's feeling okay. Right. All right. So as, as I read through these notes, um, you might want to bring one of them up again, Jerome. So okay. please do, but let's, uh, I'm going to exit full screen here for the time being, or I'm going to try to, uh, so okay. that I can look I can at adjust, it. I can adjust my screen just down to a size and still have it. it yeah. I'm, anyway, we'll I'm trying to get to the point where I can actually see the, the comments that are going. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, and so just going back, Anthony's comment on Jordan Peterson, I, I should have prefaced, I have no negative connotation with rehab. The best of us have been there and come out the other side stronger. Mama says, hi, every, uh, let's see. And um, okay, Anthony said it looked fine, full screen. John says, can see the artwork fine on YouTube. Great, all right, thank you. Um, and Mama says it's the Leviathan. Yeah, might well be. <laughs> okay, so there's a page, actually, there's two pages of footnotes here for this section. And so um, just before it, uh, there was a, a passage that I read in the last part that said, but the way is my own self, my own life founded upon myself. The God wants my life. He wants to go with me, sit at the table with me, work with me. Above all, he wants to be ever present. So there's a footnote to that which says, in 1909, Jung had his house built in Kusnak and had the following motto from the Delphic Oracle carved above the door, Vocatis atque non 
Bocatus Deus Adera, called or not, the God will be present. The source of the quotation was Erasmus's Collectania ad Giorum. Uh, Jung explained the motto as follows. It says, yes, the God will be on the spot, but in what form and, in, and to what purpose? I have put the inscription there to remind my patients and myself. Uh, and then he re refers to Psalms, um, Psalm 111, verse 10. And just, um, I'll just read that verse. The, the verse is, um, the fear of the Lord in the beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And so he's quoting it because he's saying, you know, the fear of, of um, God in your unconscious is to be feared and, and respected. And he goes on, here another not less important road begins, not the approach to Christianity, but to God himself. And this seems to be the ultimate question. Okay, and this was in a letter that he had wrote, written to Eugene Rolfe on November 19th, 1960. So about uh, six months before he died. Now, um, there's a footnote after image 154, or, uh, I'm sorry, after image 84. So could you give us image 84 again, Jerome, and I'll just read. So, um, so at the it, the foot, this isn't much of a footnote. It says, there is a note at the bottom of the page and it says 21.8. So that means August 21st, 1917. And then it says FECT, F-E-C-T and 14 by 17. I don't see that on this image, but possibly an abbre abbreviation for FESIT, i.e. made. Okay, so probably it means that he did this image on August the 21st, 1917. So right in the middle of World War I. Okay, and then the next one is uh, image number 89. Can you give us that? Okay, so here's the footnote on image 89. In Black Book 7, in Jung's fantasy of October 7th, 1917, a figure appears, Ha, who says he is the father of Philemon. Jung's soul describes him as a black magician. His secret is the runes which Jung's soul wants to learn. He refuses to teach them, but shows some examples which Jung's soul asks him to explain. Some of the runes later appear in these paintings. Above the runes in this painting, Ha explained, see the two with different feet, one earth foot and one sun foot. Interesting. Which reach toward the upper cone and have the sun inside, but I have made one crooked line toward the other sun, therefore one must reach downward. Meanwhile, the upper sun comes out of the cone and the cone gazes after it, dejected about at about where it is going. One has to retrieve it with a hook, and I would like to place it in the small prison. Then the three have to stand together, unite and twirl up at the top, curled. With this, they manage to free the sun from its prison again. Now you make a thick bottom and a roof where the sun sits safe at the top. But inside the house, the other sun has risen also. Therefore, you too are coiled up at the top and have made a roof over the prison again at the bottom so that the upper sun cannot enter. The two suns always want to be together. I said so, didn't I? The two cones each has a sun 
you want to let them come together because they then you think that you could be one you have now drawn up both sons and brought them to one another and now slope to the other side that is important but then there are simply two sons at the bottom so therefore you have to go to the lower cone then you put the two the sons together there but in the middle, neither at the bottom nor at the top, therefore there are not four, but two, but the upper cone is at the bottom and there is a thick roof above. And if you want to continue, uh, you long to return with both arms, but at the bottom you have a prison for two, for both of you. Therefore you make a prison for the lower son and fall toward the other side to get the lower sun out of the prison. This is what you long for. And the upper cone comes and makes a bridge toward the lower, taking back its sun, which has run away before. And now morning clouds come into the lower cone, but its sun is beyond the line and visible. Now you are one and happy that you have the sun at the top and long to be up there too, but you are imprisoned in the prison of the lower sun that is rising. There is a stop. Now you make something quadrilateral above, which you call thoughts, a prison without doors, with thick walls, so that the upper sun does not leave, but the cone has already gone. You lean toward the other side, long for the below and coil up at the bottom. Then you are one and make the serpent's way between the suns. That is amusing and important, but because it was amusing below, there is a roof above and you must raise upward the hook with your arm, with both arms so that it goes through the roof. Then the sun below is free and there is a prison above. You look downward at the Maybe upper sun. I'm going to just mute Craig for a minute here. Uh, okay, this is quite esoteric here. <laughs> Therefore, you make a prison for the below. Now the serpent crosses the sky above the earth. You are driven completely apart. Um, the serpent wriggles its way through the sky around all the stars far above the earth. At the bottom, it says, the mother gives me this wisdom. Be you, be you content to Anyela Yafe, young recounted that he had had a vision of a red clay tablet inscribed with hieroglyphics and embedded in his bedroom wall and that he had transcribed the tablet the following day. He felt that it contained an important message, but it, he didn't understand it. In letters to Sabina Spielrein, dated September 13th and October 10th, 1917, Jung commented on the significance of some hieroglyphic, hieroglyphs she'd seen in a dream. On October 10th, he wrote to her that, with your hieroglyphics, we are dealing with phylogenetic engrams of a historical symbolic nature, commenting on the uh, contempt meted out to um, transformations and symbols of the libido by the Freudians, he described himself as clinging to his runes, which he would not hand over to those who would not understand them. The letters of Jung to Sabina Schmielrein Journal of Analytical Psychology. Okay, then we get to um, image 93. There's a footnote. Uh, the runes in this painting appear in Black Book 7 at the entry for October 7th, 1917. Jung appended the date 7, or I'm sorry, 10 September 1917 to them. Ha explained. If you have managed to move the arc forward, you make a bridge below and move upward and downward from the center, or you separate above and below, split the sun again and crawl like the serpent over the upper and receive the lower. You take with you 
what you have experienced and go forward to something new, quote unquote. Okay, then uh, image 94 then has a, foot, a long footnote here. Okay, so this is footnote 157. The runes in this painting appear in Black Book 7 in the entry for October 7th, 1917. Jung appended the date, 11 September 1917, to them. Ha explained. Now, however, you make a bridge between you and the one longs for the below, but the serpent crawls at the top and draws the sun up. Then both of you move upward and want to go to the upper, but the sun is below and tries to draw you down. But you draw a line above and below, above the below, I'm sorry. You draw the line above the below and long for the above and are completely at one. There the serpent comes and wants to drink from the vessel of the below, but there comes the upper cone and stops. Like the serpent, the looking coils back and moves forward again and afterward. You very much long to return, but the lower sun pulls and thus you become balanced again. But soon you fall backward since the one has reached out toward the upper sun. The other does not want this and so you fall asunder and therefore you must bind yourselves together three times. Then you stand upright again and you hold both suns before you as if you, as if they were your eyes, the light of the above and the below before you and you, you stretch your arms out toward it and you come together to become one and must separate the two rooms, I'm sorry, the two suns. And you long to return a little to the lower and reach out toward the upper, but the lower cone has swallowed the upper cone into itself because the suns were so close. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just not read the rest of this because my vision isn't working for me because I have a, I have a anomaly in my eye, eyeball that keeps making me <laughs> misread this. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, that's very interesting. Um, but the point is that this is all about the opposites and one of the key opposites is conscious versus unconscious and the need to understand the transcendent function, which is getting, finding a um, way between the conscious and the unconscious and having a balance about that. And so it's the rational and the unrash unrational, the logos versus the chaos, I suppose, and uh, so on. John says, Skip, how are the mandalas related to the sacrificial murder story? I, John, I think that what he's saying there is that when he recognized how depraved he could be by looking at his own soul and understanding that this veiled figure was actually his own soul, that was asking him to do that, he was understanding just how evil he could be. And by that, then, um, I, don't, I don't know, it's like the wine is, is pure, you can learn to appreciate the good as opposed to the evil more. Okay, it's a no. diabolical request. I mean, it's, a, it's not a one-way street here. Well, it's obviously an e yeah, it's an evil request, and well, it, I wouldn't say it's evil. It's just very uh, odd and strange, you know. I mean, there is a great deep symbolism here, which is very profound, and yes. uh, you know, it 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 um, violates all standard human standards. I would say, but um, it's the anima that is is prompting him to do this. Right. You know, so, but in so terms of John's question, just 
in terms of John's question now, it seems to me that what's happening is that in the psyche, which is chaotic and it isn't actually, it's flowing, let's say, um, the mandalas and the changes in the mandalas are representing how different aspects of his psyche are flowing together in different ways. I mean, well, I'm sure it had the, the, these, these mandalas. I'm not saying that I know this, but I would assume that some of these mandalas were done in conjunction with this vision, you know? So, I mean, he is, uh, what he's doing is trying to uh, assimilate this um, strange request. Of course, now, when the anima is asking you to um, to uh, participate with it, she, you are forming a um, quaternity with her, which is some uh, is related to the mandala. I mean, in other words, there's it's it's a the anima is the soul is the bridge to the self. So she, the bridge to the self, is asking the ego consciousness to do something that is beyond all human standards right and it's it's related to uniting with the self though this is not the um personal shadow this is the um is the uh is the contrasexual bridge to the self you know and uh, so i mean there is an aspect this is how that is how i would say it's related to the mandalas that it uh, is uh, e either, um, I, I don't really see in the red book, of course, you know, um, at the end of that section in the reader's guide, it, you know, it has all these footnotes with all these uh, image numbers, but I don't see anything saying there that they're directly related to the, um, to the uh, sacrifice official murder uh, episode. Yeah, that's not that's not very clear, but I, I think that the symbolically he's trying to express the fact that all these things are flowing. I mean, let's let's look at it in the collective unconscious, for example. Um, in the past week, we've had this revelation of this phone call uh, with the president, and not getting into the politics of it or the or what was actually said, what we can see going on in the cable news media is there's a flow that goes back and forth and it involves the president and he comes up with some sort of explanation. And then there's a flow backward where others counteract that explanation. And there's a flow toward who believes them and who doesn't and and there's lots of different flows in every direction of course because it's the collective unconscious and we're talking about 315 million americans that are all reacting to this one event but you can you can envision or at least i can envision that this is a flow of information and we're nowhere near yet understanding how it's all going to come out it flows around and and so if you tried to assign let's say a color to all the different positions that are presented there uh, and then tried to diagram uh, without any words what the flow is you know it could be an interesting work of art i suppose you know, I'm th I'm thinking that uh, those different images could be an evolution so that at least in my experience, if I'm trying to digest a very difficult matter every day, in fact, even sometimes hour to hour, my psyche is changing so that the image I would produce would be a little different. And over a period of a month or even longer, it would have these different uh, shapes. Different. It, it would show the evolution of what's going on within him. And since that was such a huge, made such a huge impact on him, the eating of the liver, that would have taken some time 
to digest and the right. psyche changing. So Carl says how this might tie into the story of Abraham and his son and Jephthah's daughter who he actually did sacrifice. Um, well, again, you know, you can imagine that parents who were being asked to, to um, sacrifice their children, uh, that must have been quite painful. And I mean, we've sublimated it today because we also sacrificed 58,000 of my generation in the Vietnam War, but we didn't call it human sacrifice. We called it war. Um, but nonetheless, that's what it was. <laughs> okay. And uh, whether it got us anything is an open question. But uh, well, the, the sacrifice is really symbolic yes. of, of a um, of the ego um, uh, quieting down and and the center of gravity of awareness being moved towards uh, uh, the uh, towards the self, you know. So the the sacrifice really means uh, both the one that Christ had, and also uh, Aries was uh, the ram was the symbol of sacrifice. Taurus mm -hmm. the bull was the symbol of sacrifice of right. uh, the three previous ages. But the idea was. Uh, um, you must sacrifice your animal nature. You must sacrifice uh, um, uh, your ego. You must be um, suspended at the midpoint of a quaternity. That's what the crucifixion means, is that ego consciousness is suspended at the center of a quaternity, which is formed by the cross. And, you know, and, and so uh, explain what the quaternity is in that okay. case. Well, the quaternity is the four. Uh, you know, is is actually it is um, four directions wholeness. Uh, it's you know, it's it's the four functions. It's uh, you know, young will always give you this. Um, no, but in terms of Christianity, Greg, what is, what is the quaternity that relates to Christ? the cross? Yes, it's the cross. That's the symbol. But what are the four things on the ends of the cross? Um, well, the one that's missing is the female <laughs> that, you know, uh, what you find in Christianity is a trinity. Uh, and uh, so, you know, Jung says in Ion, it's what is missing is is the feminine or uh, Jesus's dark brother, who is uh, is actually the son of the mother. You know, I mean, that. OK, was, why well, I, I think. I think you're getting lost in the weeds of Jungian psychology here. I, it seems to me that in specifically with respect to Christ, upward represents God the Father. Downward represents earthly existence. And left and right are the two thieves, one that goes to heaven and one that goes to hell, one that's the good thief who who apologizes and is, is repentant, and the other is the bad thief who refuses to repent and goes to hell. Well, that that's one that is a, a image of a quaternity, but I think the one that Young is speaking of, you know, is um, is really a X-ray of the psyche, not just of Christianity. You know, it's, okay, it, I mean, yeah, fair enough. Okay, I, I want to go back now. Let's wrap this particular segment up. I, I do want to go back to Info Overdose's question about synchronicity or comment about synchronicity. But before we do that, are there any other comments that any of the panel want to make about the sacred or sacrificial, sacrificial murder and the images that we've been talking about up till now? The one thing I think, I, I, at least when I, the only thing way to help myself on this thing was to go reread uh, the uh, bl the what the blue shade told uh, Philemon and and Young in the garden, and what the red one told Young in the. I mean, this these are the two poles uh, which Young was caught between, you know, and right. that that was where. 
I went when I first read this is I said, well, I need some way of orienting myself. And, and I, you know, you could also talk about the Anabaptists and some of the other, how do I orient myself with this image? Well, which, but it's not Jung that was caught in it. We're all caught in it. Yes. Okay. We're all caught in it. Okay. Any other comments about uh, Nancy? Did you want to talk at all more about uh, this idea of uh, the poison and recognizing the evil? Well, I will mention that. Um, I have a little book here called The Little Course in Dreams, a basic handbook of Jungian dream work by Robert Bosnack. Mm -hmm. and he has a chapter in here about the healing poison. And in a dream, sometimes you're required to eat the healing poison, but the result is healing. And in my own life, I had a dream in which uh, there's a little baby that is just glowing and full of energy, but covered with excrement. And I know I'm supposed to eat some of that excrement. And I know that because I just read this book the night mm -hmm. before. And so I do. And all of a sudden, just huge uh, changes start to happen within my psyche. And a lot of repressed things began to unravel. And the next morning, after nine and a half years of severe illness, I woke up well. Wow, that's that's very powerful. Um, okay, well, let's go back to the synchronicity comment, which Info Overdose made. He says, comment on about synchronicity, very disturbing synchronicity that I had last week about four days ago. I had a weird feeling about a friend of mine. Uh, I kept getting the feeling that they were going to pass away. And four days later they did and they were killed. And this was out of nowhere. And so does anybody want to comment on that? Well, that's kind of a telepathy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's more of a, a, a or a, um, ESP type of, of occurrence. Usually when you talk about synchronicity, you're talking about a Kairos moment uh, where um, the, the physical world and the invisible world unite in a uh, in a event. So in other words, the psyche and the and the uh, what happens in the outer world unite in, in an event of meaning you know, which is a creative moment, you know, young. Yeah, but I, I take that. I, what you just said, I take very much as a synchronicity, very much like what he's talking about here. Well, yes, it, 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 it very much could be. But it, this this one is um, an unusual one uh, uh, where you are foreseeing someone's death. That is uh, right. a, a, not exactly. Uh, the typical uh, one that is related to a, a, a moment in your life that is a pivotal moment in your psychic life where you have. Um, well, I don't know whether it's, I don't know that it is not typical because I, I have a numinous experience related exactly to this, which is that it must have been at least 55 years ago or 50 years ago, or no, more than that, 65 years ago. I, mean, I was like seven or eight years old. There was a television program. And in that television program, the chief character had a, started to have an ability where someone that he know, knew or saw would have a certain kind of light come across their face. And when that happened, he knew that they were going to die. Okay, and so I can vouch for the fact that that's at least 60 years old. Um, and so that was in somebody's writing repertoire then. And in my own case, I don't, I don't have I do have experience of light coming on people in different ways, but um, 
I don't have an experience of death, but for example, there was one kid I knew when I was six years old and, and uh, I used to see a light come across his face. So just his face got brighter, like a light was being shined on it. And I knew he was lying. As soon as he said anything that was not true, I would know it instantly from that light. Um, and so that sort of thing uh, certainly does happen in, in, a synch in a synchronicity sense. I mean, some people may say it's paranormal. I, I say it's normal and that, you know, it's like Dr. Jung had these five dreams before World War I and he was actually plugged into the collective unconscious and he didn't know it at the time that this is in the red book and it's what caused him to actually discover the collective unconscious because he was he must have been very intuitive and sensitive and so he was receiving ideas from all around him in switzerland at the time and uh, he said on August the 1st, 1914, he was the happiest person in the world because he knew he wasn't going crazy because he knew that he was, he was sensitive enough to pick up on the fact that war was coming. Well, you know, with our dreams, our dreams can be predictive at times. Right. And, uh, so this would be like he's having a waking dream knowing that this person is going to die. So this would be coming from, up from the deep layers of the unconscious where time is different than it is in present time. That can right. give us future uh, things like this. Yeah, so what I've learned is whenever some idea comes to your head spontaneously, uh, you should pay attention to it. Okay, it, it has a meaning. It, it, it's, it's your unconscious or the collective unconscious telling you something that you need to know. I mean, I had this uh, experience very specifically um, with respect to um, uh, one of John Verveke's talks on uh, escaping the meaning crisis where I was listening to his lecture, and of course, he's, he's a philosopher, and he's very logic, logos-oriented, and um, I had two things come up spontaneously while I was listening to that video. One of them was uh, a Paul Simon tune, which is um, um, Kodachrome, and Kodachrome begins with the line, if I... Um, if I think of all the crap I had to learn in high school, it's a wonder I can think at all. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the line. And then five minutes later, I'm still listening to it. And I, I, I was literally on the exercise bike at my gym. And suddenly I had this vision of a silver cross coming into my hand and myself holding the silver cross up between me and this video. Okay, and basically it was saying that, you know, the, the, the Logos-oriented approach is literally sucking the life out of us. Right? And, and that you need this uh, protection from the vampire in order to uh, have life, life itself. Uh, and I thought that those were two very profound things. And so whenever you do, I mean, I happen to be very intuitive. So these things happen to me every day. But, um, you know, if some idea comes into your head or some image comes into your head, uh, it's not only dreams you should be thinking about, but also visions like that. Because in all those cases, both dreams and visions, your psyche is trying to tell you something that it thinks you need to know. And uh, sometimes it doesn't know what you know. In other words, your psyche 
is vintage whatever year you were born. And so it doesn't necessarily know things that are in the 21st century with you because it's based on the evolution of your psyche for the last three and a half billion years. Um, but it's, it, it's evolved from all of your ancestors and there have been millions of them that have stayed alive and reproduced to produce you, to get to you. And so it does know something. <laughs> and and it, it's telling you things all the time. And so then it's up to you with your ego to decide whether, you know, whether that spirit that's coming to you from the psyche is, is good or bad in this specific situation and whether it applies to the 21st century, of course. Um, yeah, I think we just have to learn to listen to it and... Uh... A lot of times I've been directed by it to do things. I have no idea what's going to happen. I just go do it, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes nothing happens, and then sometimes something great happens. Yeah. And it's just kind of following those messages no matter what. It seems yeah. like you, you, know? have, you have to. <laughs> and let's see. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at some other comments that have come up here. Um, and Carl was talking about orient or orienting ourselves between the poles. And then uh, uh, Mama says, that's crazy, Skip. When my grandma was about to pass, I kept seeing her face all beautiful and light for two weeks prior to her passing. I kept calling my mom and asking her about it. So, Mama, did did your mother see it too? That's the question. I mean, were you both seeing it? Um, and so Carl says, here's the thing. The anima told the ancient Semites and other ancient peoples to sacrifice children. No? Yes. Obviously, she did. And now Abraham is generally talked about among fundamentalist camps as being a man of great faith. Um, actually, what Abraham was doing was breaking out of the out of the cycle on a, and causing the end of human sacrifice. That that's what is represented there. Um, and you know, his ego realizing that he could sacrifice a goat instead of his son. Um, and um, and so Carl says, murder is also considered wrong. Yes, and that that's what I said. They say what matters is compliance to God. Um, well, I mean. We have to understand God in terms of modern categories of understanding. Okay, we can't just give up our common sense and do things based on what a psyche that's three and a half million years old and was designed to live in, in uh, the pompous of Africa originally <laughs> accept everything that it has. I mean, um, you know, I keep having this vision of the police car coming across in front of me, and I'm, I'm sure that's my psyche telling me that that's a predator. But of course, I don't think of the police as predators consciously. I don't consciously think that, but my psyche somehow thinks that the police are predators. So, um you know, because it, it comes up at times when there's a speed trap or something like that. Um, and or it's my psyche is telling me to be careful because the police are here, something's up. Um, and uh, Carl says, yet some people have very vicious gods. Well, that that's the point of this whole conversation tonight, which is that we all have very vicious gods and 
we all need to um, examine ourselves. Uh, what What's the counterpart within ourselves um, that is comparable to what Dr. Jung was saying about eating the liver of the girl, um, the divine child in this case is what he was calling her. And, um, and, and so we all have the, some vicious ideas that come up from time to time. I mean, I, I remember when I was in college one time, um, I had, I had this vision. I was sitting in a lecture. I was listening to a lecture of my favorite professor and I envisioned having in my hand a submachine gun like like uh, Elliot Ness would have used and mowing it across his chest. Okay, now that's a really evil thought. And yet it came to my mind when I was 19 or 20 years old. And so maybe we ought to rethink how we educate people about their psyches. Um, and Anthony says, if God were simply good, there would be no evil precisely. Um, and, uh, and Anthony says, there is evil, therefore God cannot be all good precisely. This is a point that Dr. Jung made at great length throughout Ion and uh, other of his writings. Okay, uh, we've gone two hours here. Does anybody else want to make some final comments here before we call this to a halt? I would just like to speak to the person who had that intuition uh, that these people were going to die. To have that kind of intuition and then to have that actually happen can be terribly uh, stunning and frightening to a person. And I would just suggest to that person that they hold the question in their heart, what am I to do when something like that comes to me? And I think they'll get an answer if they just keep that question alive. Yeah, I, I think that that makes very good sense. And of course... Well, and, and also I would add that uh, these are common things that have been happening since time immemorial, people having those things. And it's, it's not abnormal at all. It's uh, Yeah, it's not abnormal, that's for yeah, sure. It's just something that you've, first time experiencing it, you wonder about it. But then, you know, as I said, this is something that we need to know. That it's uh, a normal happening. Uh, we become attuned to that uh, happening, in other words. That well, painting uh, that Young does of uh, all those faces are oh, yeah. people that he saw. I mean, he saw them uh, either after they died or before they died. Whenever he would often see a face of someone and then they would die a couple days later. And if you look at that painting, uh, I, I mean, I almost see, I mean, I was just asking a couple of people. You know, I can see his grandfather, uh, Carl, you know, the first Carl Gustav Young. Looks like there's Gerda is there. And I, I you know, you can also probably see some of his. Uh, uh, well, I, I, if you look, they're just mysteriously uh, familiar. Right. Craig is referring to the very last uh, image in the Red Book. And I'm just looking to see if I can find this image because we I don't think we have one that we can just it, it's unfinished pull up on the uh, screen but oh here it is okay so I, I can show it to you it's on page 169 of the folio edition but this is the image yeah that was an unfinished uh, image uh, that uh, he never did uh, that was what well, you know he just gave up work on the red book after he met uh, Richard Wilhelm and it was somewhat related to when his mother died and he started Bollingen so I mean he wanted to make a uh, testament or a confession in stone and uh, this was something that came up after he met Wilhelm and so he felt that he needed to do something more uh, 
you know, less abstract. Yeah, well, he he was doing creative things throughout his life. Um, and it just happened that the Red Book wasn't where it was going then because uh, he in, instead wrote 20 volumes of the collected works <laughs> and the Red Book isn't part of it. <laughs> so about 14 volumes volumes of it were written after the Red Book was, was uh, abandoned. He tried to go back to the Red Book 30 years later, and he just couldn't really do it. And uh, the Red Book actually ends in the middle of a sentence, believe it or not. Well, that this is something that's supposed to be discussed more in, in the protocols, because uh, the young family left out something he had told Anyala Yaffe about his visions of people who were going to die. And uh, they just thought that would make him look too crazy. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's lots of things going to be in the protocols. Now, for, the, for people who are watching this video that don't understand what we're talking about, the protocols are the actual notes that Anyala Yaffe wrote during the time that she was preparing Dr. Young's autobiography, so-called. Um, unedited, and there's Yeah, unedited, and it's, it's about... 850 pages. Right, it's 850 pages, and uh, the Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which are the book that actually got published, was only 350. So the... Store, as the story goes, the unedited version of these protocols that Anyala Yaffe kept will be published next year. That's what they say. Well, and you're, you're going to be very busy, uh, Skip, because seven volumes of the Black Books are coming out uh, in a slipcase version, whatever that means, in June of 2020. Yeah, it's going to be a busy year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's the black books plus the um, the, the protocols. The ET no the ATH oh, the seminars ETH. are yeah, coming out. Also, a wonderful volume of the dream seminars about Wolfgang Pauli's dreams will be coming out in November. Oh my and god! And this this November next year. Cherished... No, November this year. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, good. a very cherished um, a seminar that um, you know. Uh, Polly's um, dreams were in psychology and alchemy. Uh, you know, he had some dreams from of Polly there. But this is a whole seminar just on Polly's dreams that comes out in November this year. Oh my goodness! And uh, I was told by James Hollis that there's still thirty-five thousand letters that haven't been published. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's been five million words. Uh, published in English by Young. There's more than that that hasn't been published. I believe it. I believe it. So it's going to be an interesting time, and hopefully we're sensitizing people to some of the high points here, and, and then we can all enjoy these new, new publications as they come out. Uh, there was a, a publication a couple of days ago by Chiron that was talking about the good and evil in political situations. I'm not sure I can find it, but um, I did order it for myself. So where did I? Anyway, if you look on Chiron's website, Chiron Publication, C-H-I-R-O-N, you'll probably see uh, that um, you'll probably see that book. I, I get so much information in anymore that I just can't cope with everything. <laughs> anyway, okay, we'll uh, call it a, a night for now. And uh, I'll well, I enjoyed it, Skip, yeah, and I hope much. that... Uh, Hope that uh, other people will be encouraged to get some Jungian books and start reading. <laughs> Absolutely.
Okay, thank you all. Uh, we'll be here again next Monday at 8 p.m. And then uh, on the 7th of October, we'll be doing our next uh, session at Sammy's. That should be easier next time because I will have my new iPad Pro with me, so I'll be able to follow chat a little bit more easily then. And so... And I still haven't figured out whether I can do Zoom on the iPad Pro. I'm going to try, but that's still to be tested. Yeah, just give it a test run and see before you. Right. Yeah. Right. So, peace, everybody. Talk to you. Uh, when, I'll see most of you on Wednesday for the advanced group. And if uh, anybody is listening that wants to hit the little dollar sign button and give the uh, a super chat. Thank you for this evening. That would be welcome. Um, so anyway, peace. Yeah, uh, bye bye. Take care now.